सर प्लीज प्रोसीड ओके हाय फ्रेंड्स एंड गुड इवनिंग वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू बेसिकली आई एम डॉक्टर अजय अरोड़ा प्रिंसिपल साइंटिस्ट इन डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ प्लांट फिजियोलॉजी आई आर आई इंडियन एग्रीकल्चर रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट सो बेसिकली uh i have been invited by dr sandhya gupta and uh, dr dwedi so i am really thankful at the outset of uh, this presentation i would be really thankful to these two people who invited me for this talk and uh, he they wanted basically that uh, i should present uh, in a very general way the plant hormones in horticulture so i'll come to this part later but uh, first of all i'll let you know about myself uh, i joined uh, iari in 1991 in the ars scheme uh, basically the icr scheme so after that uh, 1991 onward uh, i started working in different areas so basically right now i am working in the area of post harvest physiology and uh, as well as the abiotic stress tolerance in uh, wheat crop so i am involved in uh, the basic physiological processes biochemical processes as well as the molecular aspect related to the plant hormones in horticulture so uh, i will the whole of my talk is divided into basically uh, the two parts the first 50% of the part will be dealing mainly or basically with the students and uh, the later part uh, you will find it out glimpses of uh, our lab group research uh, in which i will uh, give you a bullet kind of form and i will explain about uh, uh, the major in the case of major emphasis will be on ethylene and uh, signal transduction pathway in the case of ethylene and how we have created uh, different kind of transgenic plants in relation to the gladiolus plant and from gladiolus to the tomato and then arabidopsis and other things i'll come to that part later but before going into detail of uh, this particular uh, topic which i have decided because uh, this is uh, basically uh, everyone can understand the importance and the application of plant hormones in horticulture so uh, because this is not me because i'm going to tell you about it so uh, means uh, the pa uh, past immemorial many people have shown the importance the and the orientation of these plant hormones in the horticulture field so the whole of the agriculture and horticulture they have shown that uh, the importance of plant hormones is really very very significant and uh, how we can deal with this particular topic and in my opinion this is my personal opinion that uh, uh, without plant physiological work without plant physiological input plant physiology molecular biology and biotechnology these are basically uh, the different kind of tools which we can employ in the horticulture field so similarly in any kind of perishable crops like floriculture the vegetables mm -hmm. or the fruits if we can employ these kind of tools the like physiological tools the molecular biological tools or the biochemical tools this will really uh, enhance uh, the visibility of our research so in my opinion this part is really very very important so uh, maybe if uh, uh, if all you permit me i'll go ahead and uh, uh, the uh, i i don't know the procedure here in this kind of uh, online uh, interaction but uh, that's the reason i have given my email id two email id i have provided and my mobile number also so mm -hmm. if you have any queries question or any comments you want to give it to me for further improvement in my talks so you are most welcome and uh, you can provide me on my mobile number on my email id whenever you wish but if time will permit i don't know because uh, i have lot of uh, slides and i have lot of uh, enough material for uh, but before that if i uh, i am going to start the things but uh, uh, let me start for the particularly for the students i don't know how many students are attending this uh, lecture series but i came to know that more than 1000 people are attending so maybe uh, i i hope that uh, more than 50% of them are students so if uh, students are there so slowly slowly i will pick up the things and i'll come to my original research area point of thing but uh, for a better understanding of uh, plant hormones we should know about uh, the definition of plant hormones so the phytohormones 
so definition is uh, not new but uh, there are always little little changes after one decade or another decade so let me tell you about uh, the phytohormone so phytohormones in general people are saying that uh, they regulate cellular activities so cellular activity means cell division cell elongation and cell differentiation so these three cell division cell elongation and cell differentiation so these phytohormones regulate these kind of activities pattern formation this is very important i will come to this part maybe little later but this pattern formation in the case of flower fruits and the vegetable crops these are very very important organogenesis reproduction sex determination sex determination in the uh, uh, particularly in the case of cucurbits and uh, the specific family is cucurbitaceae and uh, means uh, at last but not the least the responses to abiotic and biotic stresses i think this is very very important part and i'll deal with this in, in a in a in a flash of manner because uh, there are many other things which i would like to take up so let's go to the phytohormones old timers and newcomers so phytohormones basically there are five classical hormones i think from eighth class onwards people are studying about uh, auxin cytokinin gibberellin abscisic acid and ethylene so these five classical hormones people are known from uh, since class eighth onwards and but there are a long list and a long list of uh, hormones or pgr I, i should say they want to come into the bandwagon of this class major class of phytohormones like brachynesteroids salicylates and jasmonates and the latest one latest one is strigolactone so these strigolactones were discovered in 2008 the two paper came in the science in the same issue in the same issue one from the uh, one lab another from the second another lab so i'll a little bit touch upon those kind of uh, hormones also and uh, as you all people know that phytohormones regulate all stages of the plant life cycle starting from embryogenesis seed dormancy germination growth and branching flower development fertilization and fruit formation and last but not the least the fruit ripening fruit growth and growth development and ripening so because our the main focus of this particular presentation is on fruit ripening and uh, their growth and development and uh, again this all the stages say from embryogenesis to the fruit ripening under various kinds kinds of uh, biotic as well as abiotic stresses they are playing a major major role uh, starting from stresses under embryogenesis condition seed dormancy germination fertilization and fruit formation and ultimately the fruit ripening uh, so before coming directly attacking into the mode of uh, particularly the horticulture field i would like that uh, people should understand because reason being why i am talking about the role of hormones in the homeostasis part so the the hormonal homeostasis consists of synthesis transport perception signaling and response so right now you are seeing all the empty boxes or empty circles uh, right now but i am going to fill it up within four or five slides and you will able to know the importance of uh, all these circles so the production of active hormones during the hormonal homeostasis that is the most important part reason why i am t- talking about the production of active hormones earlier people used to talk that say if ethylene is producing a particular 10 units of amount so that 10 unit of ethylene is playing a major role in performing the different kind of response to the plant system but this is not so so because there is a degradation process also there is a transport process also there is a blockage process also and through the perception signaling pathway also there is a little loss of that particular thing so after discovery of of the first signaling transport hormone that is the ethylene receptor molecule in 1993 by anthony blicker and their group so complete production of active hormones how the transport is taking place how the binding to the receptor molecule that means the perception mechanism how the signal transduction pathway is taking place and the downstream effects in the form of responses to the plant system will take place we'll we'll see right now the first part is the synthesis as i told you about uh, the synthesis part the synthesis is consist of the any 
any phytohormone synthesis consists of conjugation, deconjugation, breakdown, and ultimately in the production of active hormone. So many tightly regulated biochemical pathways contrib contribute to the active hormone accumulation. And conjugation is playing a major role because it temporarily stores a hormone in an inert form, lead to a catabolic breakdown or degradative program, and be the means of producing the active hormone. So the synthesis uh, homeostasis part is very, very important. And this plays a mo the first and the most important part in the whole synthesis, biosynthesis, and system pathway. And uh, next is the transport and perception mechanism. After the production of active hormone, the hormone has to move from one part to the another part because this is in the definition only. So hormones can move through the xylem or phloem, as you all people are know, uh, must be knowing about it. And then across the cellular membrane, it travels. And through regulated transport protein, it plays a major role in the transport of the phytohormone. And several hormone receptors, mm -hmm. mind it, I'm repeating again, several hormone receptors have recently been identified and they can be membrane bound or soluble. I am underlining again, most of the hormone receptors are mem uh, membrane bound or soluble. This part I will deal a little uh, in detail, uh, slightly little later. The next part is signal transduction. That's the importance because the signal transduction pathway, how the message is passing on from one place to the another place that hormone signals are transduced in diverse ways. So the common method, which is popularly known as the protein phosphorylation method, protein phosphorylation and protein dephosphorylation. So we can say the reversible protein phosphorylation and targeted proteolysis form. Uh, form. So signal transduction is taking place by these two major process, protein ph phosphorylation and protein dephosphorylation. Mm -hmm. And second is the proteolysis. So we'll, we'll come to this part slightly, slowly, slowly, I'm opening up the chapter. And uh, then the downstream effect can involve the changes in gene transcription and changes is taking place. So downstream effect, major is the transcription pathways and uh, the non-genomic effect in the form of ion channel regulation. So this part. So now we can open up, as I told you earlier, all my uh, three, four slides back when you observe all the sections or the all the circles were empty. Now it is all filled. Now we can easily understand why and how the production of active hormones, hormones are taking place, how their transport is uh, going on, and the binding to the receptor molecule in the form of perception mechanism, then protein phosphorylation and protein dephosphorylation, and then proteolysis, and then further downstream effect in the form of transcription machinery, and non-genomic effect in the form of ion channel regulation. So this is a general scheme of the things which I am explaining to you people that uh, it is happening with the each and every hormone. So the, this synthesis, transport, perception, signaling, and responses. This is happening with the with with all the all the all the things easily. So uh, now you can see here the receptors can be membrane bound. That's what I told you earlier, receptors are membrane bound or the solu soluble receptor. So there are three receptors membrane bound are known, which is in the form of ethylene, cytokinin, and brassinosteroids. So these three are the membrane bound receptors. So again, I'm repeating membrane bound receptors are ethylene, cytokinin, and brassinosteroids. So this will, this hormone binding means after making a complex with the plasma membrane or the, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, these all three hormones, they binding and initiate the information relay survey. So then the relay process will start in the uh, pass on of the message from the receptor or the lesion molecule to the further machinery. And similarly, the second part is the soluble receptor. So soluble receptors can facilitate interaction between the protein. So there is a difference. They were the membrane bound, which is uh, attached to the membranes, and they are soluble receptor, which facilitates the interaction between proteins. So the hormones can act like a molecular glue. So this molecular glue is nothing but, say, like in the pyrobactin is the uh, receptor molecule of ABA, and uh, GA is the GID1, 
and uh, jasmon jasmonates is the coi one and auxin is the tar one so these are the four soluble receptors known till date and many people are studying different kind of hormones also so you can see here uh, receptors membrane bound receptors ethylene cytokine and resinesteroids and uh, soluble receptors in the form of pyruvatine aba uh, ga gid1 coi1 jasmonate tar1 and auxin so there are other is the the proteolysis pathway so some receptor initiate protein proteolysis so here you can see the uh, the red color form is the hormones which bind to the receptor in the green green uh, boxes and then initiate the proteolysis of receptor molecule uh, repressor molecules in the yellow form to activate a transcriptional regulator which is in the form of for auxin it is ara for gibberellin it is pif for jasmonate it is mic2 so they, in this form they will act and uh, they initiate the protein proteolysis and for initiating that process the proteolytic pathway the proteolytic targets are covalently linked to the ubiquitin ubiquitin is nothing but a small 76 amino acid protein that targets protein for proteolytic cleavage so you can see here uh, the target is attached with the ubiquitin and then this ubiquitin ligase complexes ubiquinate target protein so in the right panel of the figure you can easily find it out the ubiquitin is uh, ligated to the target now this ubiquitinated target protein uh, targeted for the proteolysis by 26 proteasomal pathway so this is in general i am talking about i am not going to detail because otherwise it will be confusing because uh, mm -hmm. uh, because we have to cover a lot of things so now you can see so this particular slide i am showing to many of my students and many of my colleagues also that disrupting the hormone synthesis uh, first of all before going for this particular slide i would like to explain that there are two terminology one is hormone synthesis another is hormone sensitivity so if i am talking about hormone synthesis that is involved with the biosynthesis pathway and if i am talking about hormone uh, sensitivity so that will involved in the response pathway or the signaling trans transduction pathway so uh, that that basically will show you here so now you can see the gibberellin so this is means uh, just you can see here but just by disrupting or just by degradation of the hormone synthesis or the sensitivity interfere with the elongation of the process of different plant system so that is hormones so that's what i wanted to show one you can see in the left hand panel the p is there p plant and the wild type plants you can see it's a taller one and gibberellins biosynthesis mutant you can see it's a very very dwarf plant and similarly in the brassinesteroid towards the right uh, panel you can see the wild type is a very taller plant and uh, when the bias uh, brassinesteroids biosynthesis mutant it is the smaller plant so uh, this is in the case of by uh, disruption of the hormone synthesis pathway but in the case of uh, the center panel the auxin the arabidopsis is there the wild type is there which is taller in nature and the auxin response mutant this is not the biosynthesis mutant this is the response mutant and you can see the the longer and the dwarf plant so that means if we are uh, disrupting this hormone synthesis you can feel the difference and this is uh, because uh, before coming to the some of the uh, my own research path uh, research uh, processes and the glimpses of my research mm -hmm. i would like to show you that uh, these hormones uh, plays a key role during the plant senescence also which is popularly known as the uh, the hormonal uh, the hormonal window concept so this is popularly known as plant hormone or the senescence window concept senescence window concept so related to the plant hormone so you can see there are two uh, different stages of the plant life one is senescence another is death so the cytokinin and ethylene is slowly slowly degrading and uh, they are showing uh, towards the death they are showing a declining trend but in the case of uh, auxins jasmonate and salicylate so they are showing a different kind of uh, their pattern so the that means the senescence window concept is very important for understanding the different kind of senescence or the ripening processes uh, senescence i am talking about for the 
in the case of uh, vegetable crops. So in that case, we can easily find it out the, uh, the significance of this senescence window concept. And hormone signaling pathway during the plant senescence process, uh, plant hormones trigger a cascade of events or the series of events involving four different kind of systems like the receptor molecules, transcription factors, kinases, and small RNAs. I'll repeat again, receptor, transcription factors, kinases, and small RNAs. So in the, that form, the hormonal signal pathway is playing a major role during the plant senescence pathway. So now I'll come to the cytokinin, which is popularly known as a very, very strong anti-senescence effect. So you can see here that uh, people, uh, uh, basically the GAN and MSCNO group, they started working in 1995 and they published two, three very good papers and uh, the, the sense of senescence, they have uh, one uh, article they published in the science and they have written it very nicely. If anybody is interested, I think uh, one should read that paper in 1995 from the MSNO group. So they studied the leaf senescence can be delayed by expression of a cytokinin biosynthetic gene. And that cytokinin biosynthetic gene is very popularly known as isopentenyl transferase gene. So this IPT is a substrate inducible gene, isopentenyl transferase. And uh, they, at that time, 1995, they expressed this gene under the control of the, uh, the constitutive promoter only. So uh, cauliflower mosaic virus. So the CMV virus they have used, but they still show the power of uh, this IPT gene, the, the delay uh, in the senescence of the uh, senescence process. Uh, but later on, people, uh, people tried and replaced the uh, constitutive, uh, uh, constitutive promoter to the senescence specific promoter. And uh, they, they could find it out more than 30 days or more than 50 days. People have is evenly find it out in the case of tobacco plant, in the case of Arabidopsis plant. So that was really, really great achievement by utilizing this uh, isopentenyl transferase gene. So this started in 1995 until date, more than 50 plants have been uh, uh, shown the uh, stay green trade, so delaying the process of uh, senescence. So that's the reason people are utilizing uh, uh, this cytokine has a very, very strong anti senescence effect. But opposite to that, ethylene and jasmonates, they promote senescence. So they are promoting senescence. You can see easily by the, these kind of experiments, you, you can see in the right panel, the control showing that uh, Arabidopsis seedling and uh, uh, by treatment with the jasmonates, it is showing the yellow, uh, yellow character. So, and now I'm coming to that part. Uh, now you can see the hormonal changes happening during the fruit development and ripening. So, because it uh, means at every level, if I'll talk about fruit set, fruit growth, fruit maturation, or uh, the ripening process, I think at every stage, every stage the hormonal changes is happening during the fruit development and ripening. So uh, this is basically a self-explanatory kind of uh, the slide, which you can see that differential hormone concentration occur in the seed and the surrounding tissue with the developing seed in influencing its environment. And uh, there is a meta-analysis or the multiple studies have shown that increase in the auxin, cytokinin, gibralin, and brassinistrite at the fruit set and, and at the involvement of auxin, gibralin, and brassinistrite at the fruit growth stage. They are playing the major role. So this is the outcome of a more than 15 paper study. So after the meta-analysis, they have come to these kind of conclusions. And for fruit maturation, there is an inhibition of oxygen transport and from the seed and increase in the ABA concentration. So this is for the fruit maturation. So that means I would like to, uh, I wanted to say, and I wanted to pass on the message that whole process, this triggers the ripening and senescence program, which leads to an increase in the ABA or ethylene biosynthesis. So basically, uh, in the future slide, I will uh, more concentrate on, uh, means I will start with the ethylene background as well as the ABA background. Reason being, you can find it out here. Uh, there is a certain, in the, in the panel B, you can see in the, uh, means to, uh, towards the downward side, there is a non-climatric uh, kind of uh, fruits like uh, grape, citrus, strawberry, kiwi fruits and uh, some of the climatic fruits like melon, tomato, apple, and banana. So the spectrum of ripening dependency to AB and ethylene, all fruit appear 
to respond to this AB and deflate. So that is the importance, and that's the reason I have selected these only two hormones. And but basically, the major emphasis will be on Italy, and I will come to that part later. So I wanted to introduce these two, and uh, basically these two hormones. And uh, now you can see the importance or the significance of genes involved in the biosynthesis, perception, and signaling of various hormones with their established role in tomato fruit development and ripening. Now you can find it out easily that various evidences suggest that modulation in the level of IEA, cytokinin, gibberellins, ethylene, and polyamines and brassinosteride at the fruit set level. But at the fruit growth, IEA, GA, and brassinosteride are mostly playing a role. But in the case of fruit maturation, IEA, ABA, and polyamine. And uh, cytokinin, brassinosteride, jasmonic acid, and nitric oxide, and salicylate. They are playing a major role during fruit ripening. So at different developmental growth stages of the fruit, uh, there are a different uh, set of hormones. They are playing a major, major role. So that's the importance. And uh, I have mentioned some of the genes which are characterized already and people have worked it out. People have modulated it and they have made a different kind of transgenic by overexpression or downregulation of these kind of genes, which is associated with these kind of hormones. And uh, transcriptomic studies also show the comparative uh, representation of differentially expressed genes, which is involved in the biosynthesis or signaling of various growth regulators during fruit ripening in the case of tomato. And out of that transcriptomic study, people have shown that 42% of the genes which they have shown is uh, controlled by ethylene. So that is the major power of ethylene plant hormone. And after that is the auxin. This is the case of tomato we are talking about. So 26% is in the case of auxin and seven in the case of ABA. So these three major hormones are playing a major, major role uh, by seeing this transcriptomic study. Now you can see ethylene has a lot of uh, correlation and uh, interaction with other growth regulator during the ripening process. So now you can see there is a positive relationship between ethylene and ABA. You can see uh, by the involvement of uh, their uh, uh, substrate inducible enzymes like NC, uh, NCED or ACC synthase and NCC oxidase or jasponate also and uh, brassinosteroids, cytokinin and uh, uh, auxins also. Uh, so, but opposite to that, like polyamines, cytokinin, uh, nitric oxide and gibberellins and as well as the salicylic, uh, salicylic acid. So, they are anti-ethylene. Anti they are playing a major role as an anti ethylene uh, hormone. So that means we have this kind of information or background we have right now in our hand. So that means we have the understanding of this information. Now we can utilize these all the information for our further developmental processes or maybe we can say we can go ahead and uh, do some kind of uh, research experimentation with this kind of knowledge. And uh, as you all know that ethylene promotes the flowering in the pineapples and other bromeliads. So people are utilizing this as a as a commercial uh, growers. People are using pineapple is a fruit produced from the pineapple flowers, and commercial growers treat these plants with the ethylene to synchronize the uh, flowering process. So that means uh, they are utilizing at the commercial level about uh, these plant hormones. And uh, as I told you earlier, there is a, a means in the flower developmental process, hormone contributes a lot. And uh, like in the, these four areas I have mentioned about the patterning of the floral meristem, outgrowth of the organs, development of the male and female gametophytes, and cell elongation. So that means, means at all these four uh, different stages of the flower, uh, flower development, uh, the hormones are playing a significant role. And uh, ethylene and gibberellin, which, which is very popularly known in the case of cucurbitaceae, and they are involved in the sex determination. And basically, the ACC uh, synthase as well as the gibberellins, they are well known to involve in the sex determination process. And uh, because I am, I'm showing you the, right now the power of this phytohormone. And uh, in the fruit development and ripening under the hormonal control, people have shown it uh, in more than 100 papers that pollination initiates the petal senescence, cell division, and expansion in the ovary to produce a fruit, and ultimately the fruit ripening. And uh, uh, many people are knowing about it, that uh, auxins and gibberellins promote the cell division and growth of the fruit. 
So as you know that seedless variety of grapes and other fruit require exogenous application of GA uh, for the fruit development. You can see in the center uh, panel of the things. But in the case of strawberry, it is opposite. Strawberry receptacle respond to the oxygen instead of GA. So that means this kind of information we have to generate. Otherwise, people will try with the GA only in the case of strawberry also. And they were not getting the results. So in that case, the oxygen is playing a major, major role. So depending upon the crop species and crop uh, varieties, people are utilizing this plant hormone for their understanding. And uh, fruit ripening is induced by ethylene. It is very well known. And uh, ethylene is a gaseous hormone that promotes the fruit softening and flavor and color development. People have shown already in uh, many papers about this. And uh, ethylene has been shown that they are playing a major, major role. I'm not going to detail of it. And uh, ethylene promotes the senescence of leaf and petals. Uh, this is the live example in the air. And when the ethylene is present, what, what will be happening in the two different kind of pots? The cotton plants, you can see it here. And uh, ethylene shortens the longevity. So that means ethylene, uh, some people are saying ethylene is a basically uh, enemy for the fruits and uh, flower or the vegetable crop or the perishable. But it is not so. But we can uh, go ahead and uh, utilize the various kind of uh, technologies. Right now we have over expression lines as well as the down regulation line. We can uh, easily exploit the phytohormone ethylene. So strategies are there. Now ethylene shortens the longevity of cut flower and fruits. People have known it and they have trying the different kind of aspects. Earlier people were using uh, various chemicals now, but people are saying the chemical pollution is taking place. So now they have shifted from uh, the chemical uh, te techniques to the molecular genetic approaches, which can limit the ethylene synthesis. And uh, means earlier people were using the antisense technologies, then uh, shifted towards the RNAi technology. Now presently they have used uh, the, uh, the genome editing techniques like uh, CRISPR-Cas and others. Now we have means a lot of uh, advancement in the uh, the tools and techniques we have in our hand, and now we can utilize for this kind of development. So people have made earlier in the case of tomato, they uh, made, made the ACC synthase, uh, antisense of ACC synthase. You can see we can delay the process of uh, the ripening by employing the antisense ACC synthase uh, technique. But people have made again the CRISPR-Cas uh, ACC synthase now, and uh, people are uh, employing the better techniques and they are getting the better, better results. So now ethylene regulate the gene expression is negatively regulated. So this is basically in the case of signal transduction pathway. Earlier people were not knowing that uh, ethylene is uh, negatively regulated to the their receptor molecules like. Uh, uh, like uh, ethylene uh, ETR or ERS1 and uh, there are basically in the when the discovery take, uh, took place in the case of uh, uh, Arabidopsis people have found it out there are uh, ETR1, ETR2, ERS1, ERS2 as well as IN4 so ethylene instance tip 4 so this five receptor molecule in the case of tomato they have identified six receptor molecule and people have identified in the case of more than 35 crops by now in the various uh, uh, cropping or the agriculturally important crop system. So, but they are regulated, means uh, uh, the, uh, negatively regulated in, in the case of uh, ethylene receptor. And the next place is the, uh, the uh, constitutive uh, TR molecule, the CTR molecule. Uh, again, it is a negatively regulated by ethylene regulation of the gene expression molecules. So, ethylene perception muta interfere with the ripening. So now in the case of tomato, we have green ripe uh, mutants and the never ripe mutants because of this, uh, uh, the, uh, the finding of uh, basically the ethylene receptor or perception mechanism of the mutants in that case. And this is the schematic representation of the ripening related transcription factor that influence ethylene mediated fruit ripening in the case of tomato. People have shown there are many transcription factors like ring, CNR, NOR, and many, many uh, transcription factors are involved, which is controlling the uh, various kind of ethylene-mediated uh, genes like uh, uh, ACS2, ACS4, polygalactoguronase, expensin. Means there are a, a plethora of genes we can exploit by utilizing these transcription factors. And now we'll come to the epsisic acid. As I told you, ethylene and ABA is the major 
the APA is basically the seed maturation and dormancy. They play a major, major role. Desiccation tolerance, they are playing a major role. Stress response, many uh, people must be knowing about it, that uh, ABA is also known as stress hormone and control of stomatal aperture. So that is also very, very important. So ABA biosynthesis is strongly regulated by various uh, tightly controlled levels. Like the critical steps in ABA biosynthesis, you can see here the uh, ZAP or the NCED. They are the, the substrate inducible ABA biosynthesis enzyme. So they are playing a major, major role. And people are changing the NCED level in the many crops and uh, they are exploiting the ABA level. Either they want to reduce it, they can reduce it, or if they want to overexpress it, they, they are ex overexpressing the ZEP mm -hmm. or NCD, NCD level. So the AB synthesis is strongly induced in response to the stress. You can see here the leaf water potential is increasing as well as the ABA level is increasing. So this is the, means, uh, the classical uh, ABA level rise during the draw strike due to the part increase in the biosynthesis of ABA. So it has been shown uh, whenever we have the physiological lecture. When I was a student, it was shown to us also. So that means uh, they are playing. Eh? And ABA induces the stress responsive genes uh, like uh, osmoprotectants such as sugar, proline, and glycine betaine, and membrane and protein stabilization such as the heat shock proteins, uh, the chaperons, and the late uh, embryogenesis abundant protein, LIA proteins, oxidative stress response proteins such as peroxidase, superoxide dismutase, SOD, and catalases and movement of water and iron in the form of aquaporins and the ion channel. So these water channels are playing a major, major role. So ABA induces all these stress responsive genes. So that is, that, that's the reason that makes uh, this particular hormone the most important in the case of uh, the hormonal uh, regulation of uh, various uh, kind of uh, st uh, the stress phenomena. And ABA binding to an intracellular receptor initiates the transcriptional response. So after the discovery of this uh, receptor molecules, now the PYL1 is an ABA receptor. Everybody knows about it. So then when P, uh, PYL1 binds with the ABA, it binds the protein phosphatase also. So this is the problem basically. We thought about it earlier, but the PP2C is inhibiting its function. But uh, later on, people have found it out. You can see it, it easily. Uh, when ABA is present, it inactivates the PP2C phosphatase, which permits a protein kinase in the form of SNRK to phosphorylate and activate the ABA inducible transcription factors. Uh, so that means it promotes the transcription of ABA inducible genes. So in the left hand side of the panel, you can see in the low ABA concentration, uh, PP2C is inhibiting the SNRK protein. But in the high, in the right hand uh, panel, you can see the high ABA, uh, high ABA uh, availability is uh, facilitating and uh, PP2C is uh, binding with the ABA molecule and then uh, the SNRK is uh, making, promoting the transcription of the ABA inducible gene. So this is the uh, major benefit of the ABA signal transcription pathway. Uh, this is the hormonal control of ethylene and ABA mediated signaling cascade of fruit ripening in the case of uh, tomato as a model plant system as well as strawberry. strawberry. As uh, tomato in the case of uh, uh, climactic uh, kind of flower, uh, uh, tomato is a climactic kind of fruits and strawberry is a non climatic kind of fruit. So they have shown uh, that means the ABA is playing a major, major role in the case of non climactic, such as strawberry. In the case of tomato, the ethylene is playing a major role. And there, all the components are playing a major role in this kind of. And uh, nowadays, people have started working on that from the last five years or so the crosstalk between the hormonal signaling pathway. So by, earlier people understood the, in, uh, the role of various hormones at a single level, but now the crosstalk is taking place between the hormone signaling pathway. So now crosstalk is nothing but is a, is a cross regulation, which occurs when the two pathways are not independent. So they are dependent upon each other. So it, it, can, be, uh, it can be positive, additive, synergistic or negative. So that is the advantage of this. So now you can see the crosstalk can affect the synthesis, transport, or signaling pathway of another hormone. So that means the crosstalk is taking place between the two hormones. So they are completely changing, completely changing the uh, homeostasis, the hormonal homeostasis of the both the hormones where the crosstalk is taking place. I'm just giving you one example in that. The synergistic requirement is uh, very, very important for jasmonate and ethylene. 
signaling in defense responses. So you can see here when the jasponet and ethylene signaling are both required for high level expression of ERF1 transcription factor. So that induces the defense gene expression. So you can see here in this uh, the protein, uh, uh, the, this is Western blot of uh, Y type and the uh, two mutant in the case of uh, Brassinosteroid CoE1 as well as in the IN2 in the case of ethylene transcription factor. So means uh, the crosstalk is nowadays is the buzzword and people are using this for their research uh, evidences nowadays mainly in that. So uh, I'll come again to the ripening regulation in the non-climactic roots. So you can see here the ABA is playing a major, major role in the non-climactic roots. Mm -hmm. But we are uh, not uh, sparing the ethylene synthesis pathway also because it is, it is there but in the limited synthesis. But the oxygen and gibberellins, uh, they are inhibiting the fruit ripening process in the non-climatric fruits. So in the non-climatric fruits, the ABA is playing a major role. But in the case of uh, ripening regulation, in the case of climatric fruit, ethylene pathway is playing a major, major role. So that's the crux of that. Now the new, uh, the epigenetic regulation of fruit ripening again. So maybe after one or two slides, I'll come to the uh, different kind of parts. Uh, then. Uh, this epigenetics is uh, refers to the heritable changes in the gene expression that occur without modification of underlying DNA sequencing. So that means it involves the histone uh, post-translational modification, DNA methylation, uh, which is uh, transmitted through the DNA replication and cell propagation. So the consequences of changes in DNA methylation level on the expression of ripening related genes and the majority of studies, now we have around 20 to 25 papers in the literature, we are showing the epigenetic regulation can be done through the uh, in the case of fruit ripening process. Now you can see here, this is the epigenetic changes are taking place associated with the process of senescence. So you can see here, uh, the there are three different kinds of stages, M, S1, and stage one, stage two. Mature, stage one, senescence stage, senescence one, senescence two. So you can see the DNA methylation pattern are different in all the three stages at the mature stage, early senescence stage and the late senescence stage. So that means epigenetic changes are playing a major, major role. And uh, several mutants have been identified in the case of uh, Arabidopsis and they are they are uh, affected by epigenetic regulation which show the alter time of senescence. So you can see here the AX1-5 is a histone acetylase mutant which is showing the delay of senescence process. So I think these kind of mutants are really very useful for uh, our kind of uh, ripening and senescence kind of research, which we can utilize for the epigenetics, uh, epigenetics involvement in the case of perishable and uh, fruit ripening and senescence. Now, uh, this was basically a part of uh, which I was explaining to you regarding that. But now I'll come to uh, the glimpses. I am giving you only the bullet form. Uh, basically, the research we have done in the last uh, 10 years or so in our lab, and uh, I, I'll, I'll just tell you uh, the basically our uh, the project were basically on the regulation of fruit ripening and flower senescence. We were concentrated mainly on that, and uh, uh, means uh, many of my students, uh, research associate, uh, senior research fellows, they worked in the case of the first student were uh, they worked in the case of uh, role of cytokinin and nitric oxide in regulation of flower senescence in the case of gladiola. And uh, the second part is the role of salicy salicylic acid in post-harvest physiology of tomato. Then uh, the importance of the protease and senescence. Uh, we characterize the protease uh, during the flower senescence in the case of uh, gladiolus. Then we characterize the cysteine protease gene during the floral development and senescence in ethylene insensitive kind of flowers uh, in, like uh, the gladiolus. And uh, then I'll uh, go into detail of this because uh, this is in the last, I'm going to take it up, the role of ethylene receptor and ripening and senescence. Uh, this particular part, even uh, one of my postdoctorate studies in, uh, in, in the Japan for two years, I w did work on uh, ethylene receptor molecules and the involvement in the ripening and senescence aspect. I will go into detail of it slightly later. And uh, then we studied about the role of banana peels uh, this was wonderful uh, idea we started with and uh, means the, the importance of banana, banana peels as a source of valuable 
nutritional component uh, like the uh, golden rice we wanted to make the golden banana but uh, because of certain reason we have to stop uh, this particular program in the, our institute reason being uh, there is a specific uh, institute working in the case of banana so we did not uh, got uh, permission from our higher ups for to carry on this particular uh, project but this still i feel uh, for the development of a golden banana by utilizing the peels of the banana we can go ahead and uh, work it out and polyols regulate the flower senescence by delaying the pc program cell death the pcd process in the case of gladiolus and uh, lastly we have finished in the case of 2018 only the importance of the endogenous salicylic acid which is mediated the regulation of post post harvest life of tomato so we have shown in that case uh, still uh, one uh, girl is working in uh, that area uh, I'll, i'll come to uh, come slightly and show about that so this is again uh, i wanted now i told you that special emphasis will be on the case of ethylene but uh, frankly speaking i don't want to go into detail of uh, again the importance of ethylene uh, but uh like in the case of uh, means there should be authority in in any kind of area so in the case of ethylene uh like uh, if uh, you wanted to watch the cookery show or uh, you want to make some recipe so there is always in the mind that uh, San- sanjeev kapoor is the best person who is making a different kind of dishes so the authority in the case of ethylene and uh, signaling trans- uh, transduction pathway so it seen signal transduction pathway the anthony blaker he is no more right now but uh, he is wonderful uh, scientist from us and they started and they published a uh, first paper in the case of uh, in the in the science and uh, they showed and later on they published in the case of nature biotech also they showed the importance of ethylene signal transduction pathway and they utilized this uh, ethylene triple response assay so they Uh, means uh, by just by utilizing this uh, three important processes which is popularly known as triple response and they came into the conclusion and uh, these are this particular slide i wanted to show you reason being the how we can manipulate the ethylene biosynthesis pathway so there are five major pathways in the ethylene biosynthesis pathway so like uh, acc synthase as i told you earlier also and acc oxidase these two uh, people have uh, manipulated by Uh, antisense pathway and uh, the third one is by converting the sam which is a popular uh, uh, substrate which is uh, one for ethylene another for polyamine biosynthesis pathway so there is a tug of war between uh, polyamine polyamine biosynthesis pathway as well as ethylene biosynthesis pathway so there the third major important uh, uh, enzyme is the sam decarboxylase if we can uh, means manipulate sam decarboxylase there are seven eight papers already in the literature which have shown they have manipulated the sam decarboxylase then two three papers in the case of sam hydrolase and the uh, one or two paper in the microbiological uh, pathways uh, where they have shown the acc dna so they manipulated this five pathway to to reduce the ethylene level or to higher up or the over express the ethylene level in any kind of plant system they have worked it out so this is the first paper i was talking about the anti sense uh, suppression of acc oxidase gene which prolonged the shelf life of the transgenic fruit when compared with the wild type so this was the first paper that's the reason but uh, that i was talking about the anthony blicker and their group because after uh, having the the molecular genetical approaches they started working with the means this three assumption because basically they started uh, working on this three assumption the whole signal transduction pathway in the case of Uh, ethylene so means after getting the ethylene uh, many people started working with uh, various kind of uh, other uh, hormone uh, hormonal signal transduction pathway so what they assume at that level that ethylene exerts its effect in plant at nanomolar concentration so that means they thought about it there must be a sensitive perception system or high affinity receptor molecules must be there so they postulate about that so this was the first assumption they thought and given the simplicity of the ethylene structure as you know it is c2h4 so it is such a simple molecule so they thought they postulate that the specific recognition should be there there must be zinc or copper containing protein must be there and then later on they find it out it is copper and uh, then the I, i told you about the application of molecular genetic approaches so they started working on this 
So this particular first experiment they did, and they did it at ten to twelve times to to make it make it come. So this is for basically for the students. I would like to tell that uh, sometimes what we did this kind of experiment, we always throw the which is abnormal in nature. We should not. So whatever abnormal is there, I think we should concentrate on that. So that abnormal is very very important for research point of view. So they did this particular experiment. You can see one tall uh, uh, this uh, seedling, which is uh, later on pointed out the whole ATR mutant molecule. So the receptor molecule was pointed out through this. They mutagenized uh, the seed grown in the dark in the presence of ethylene and yielded the ATR mutant. That is mutant in which the triple response to ethylene is absent. So that means this is uh, not responsive. So this particular seedling, all the other seedlings are showing the triple response. That that's the reason they are showing uh, the dwarf in nature, but except the one taller one. So they dissected this in the case of Arabidopsis, and they further uh, gone into this. And uh, means you can point it out. They mm -hmm. isolated the the ETR one molecule as well as the CTR molecule, and uh, means really this is uh, hats off to these people. They worked it out and. Uh, now each and every receptor molecules are, are in uh, the literature available because of uh, I, right now because uh, the time is short because i have to show you some of my experiments also so maybe the this uh, bacterial two component regulatory system they find it out it is involved in the uh, ethylene signal transduction pathway i'll skip some of these slides uh, and uh, but uh, these uh, etr1 protein express in the trans uh, in transway in the case of uh, yeast and uh, show the binding affinity and uh, they find it out only one amino acid at the 65th amino acid of the whole ethylene receptor molecule system at the which is changing from the cysteine to the tyrosine so mind it again i am repeating again uh, the cysteine to the tyrosine the 65th amino acid just one amino acid was changed in that tall seedling which i was showing you except in the tall seedling which is insensitive in nature to the ethylene so that uh, opened the floodgates and uh, means the receptor molecules was easily find it out and this is the domain structure of the etr1 family and they have shown there are four major domains ethylene binding domain guf domain histidine kinase domain and the receiver domain so these four domain the bleaker and their group they have shown it and uh, work it out in very detail I think uh, for each and every domain, they have published two or three paper in science, nature, or nature biotech. So that means uh, these kind of uh, high kind of research these people have done. And uh, this this is the final signal transduction pathway. They have shown it, and the genetic interaction and biochemical identities of the components. It is very well recognized now. And they have shown there is a ETR family which is converted again to pass on the message from ETR. Legend ethylene to the ETR combination complex to the CTR, then MAP kinase cascade system, then IN2, then to the transcription factor, and further the responses is taking place. So that means that was the, and this is the paper I was talking about in Nature Biotech from the Wilkinson and their group. They create a transgenic plant expressing a single gain of function mutant. This is the gain of function I'm talking about. The cysteine was uh, converted into the 65th amino acid of the tyrosine. So this is the gain of function mutant of the ethylene receptor, which display an ethylene insensitive phenotype. So uh, basically, uh, having this kind of background, all this kind of background, I will go to the details. Uh, just a moment, please. So this, uh, uh, we thought about the complete uh, understanding of uh, the ethylene signal transduction pathway. So now we have identified and dissect the, in the case of gladiolus. Gladiolus is basically an uh, uh, ethylene insensitive kind of flowers. So we wanted to know why it is ethylene insensitive. And if it, if it is ethylene insensitive, why the, their uh, shelf life or the wasp life is around five to eight days. So, but for the rose and other climactic kind of flowers or the uh, ethylene sensitive kind of flowers, it is showing one or two days only. So that's the reason we have selected this particular uh, gladiolus crop and we have identified these two genes, GGERS1A and GGERS1B. This is the first time we have identified two kind of ERS1G in any kind of plant system. 
So these two genes we have found it out, but uh, we find it out very difficult. I mean, the reason being, uh, reason being, uh, this is the amino acid sequence. Reason being, people were not uh, expecting because this is the first report, and people were not uh, easily ex uh, expecting that uh, there are two kind of genes. Everybody was saying maybe there is a possibility that you are getting the uh, wrong results. So we have to sh show them through the uh, this northern blot uh, first, uh, the RT PCR analysis, then that this is the nor northern blot. And this is the uh, southern blot, and, uh, and this is the southern blot uh, expression analysis. So we did it a lot of time, but people were again uh, having a doubt on these kind of studies. Then we have shown uh, by different kind of genomic DNA isolation, and we did a lot of molecular analysis. I'm not going to detail. Uh, then finally, when we got the Western analysis, and uh, then people were having a surety that. Uh, that that this is sure now we are we are getting the two bands now so you can see here we have expressed in the detection of ethylene receptor protein by using anti cmers1 molecule but uh, in the case of uh, left hand uh, band you can see the uh, cucumis mellow ers1 there is a single band but in the case of gg ers1 there are two kind of band so uh, this was the first uh, means uh, but again, people were saying, why not you are uh, making the, uh, why you are using, still using anti-CM. So we made the antibodies for the GGERS1, our own gladiolus ERS1 antibodies. And again, we got the similar kind of results of two bands. So now people accept, uh, easily accept, ac expecting this and uh, easily accepting our uh, uh, viewpoint that there are two kinds of ERS1 gene and they are showing different kind of uh, gene expression patterns. And uh, then we standardized in the case of uh, gladiolus carmels, the plant regeneration protocol. We, again, uh, yeah, we wanted to show that uh, we create a, a special uh, plasmid molecule for subcellular localization of ethylene receptor of gla uh, gladiolus. And this uh, subcellular localization, this was the one in the case of Arabidopsis. This was the second report uh, uh, globally where we have shown that subcellular localization of GFP fused with full length of our GGERS1 cDNA. And we show that uh, the, the lo localization of our GGERS1 molecule is basically in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. So uh, means this gave us a wonderful uh, expo exposition that uh, these kind of results uh, you can see here. And this, uh, this uh, paper we published in the BBRC and uh, again, we have done uh, means uh, the cloning of GGRS1B and in the binary vector, uh, the various kind of the, these molecular technologies we have used. And we did the real time PCR expression analysis. And we created a transgenic antisense uh, suppressed GGRS1 gene in the case of Ara Arabidopsis, as well as in the case of tobacco. And uh, uh, we further. Uh, did some of the physiological analysis of those transgenic in the oxidative stress. It means uh, on the basis of complete uh, expecting line, we are getting these kind of results. And uh, antioxidative uh, enzymes and the capacity, antioxidative capacity of the plant enhanced by overexpression of these kind of genes. And uh, this is the agrobacterium uh, mediatory transformation we have done in the case of tomato also. And uh, in the case of tomato uh, transgenics, this is the best result we in the case of southern blot we have run and we got that uh, ggrs1 the transgenic tomato plants and uh, in tomato uh, transgenics the oxidative stress studies again the chlorophyll content the photosynthesis parameters the softening enzymes this was again giving us a, the pme activity the polygalactoriduronase enzymes these are showing a wonderful result and we got uh, uh, on the expecting lines only so this is the ripening status after 36 hours of April treatment uh, to the wild, wild uh, tomato plants as well as the transgenic uh, tomato crops. So we, we got a wonderful result and uh, you can see the difference by seeing uh, through the visual eyes also. The wild type tomatoes are uh, after getting the 36 hours of April treatment, it is becoming red and the other our transgenics are becoming still green mm -hmm. in nature. Then uh, we developed the Arabidopsis transgenic also and uh, transgenic Arabidopsis plants show uh, ethylene uh, evolution pathway and it is showing uh, reduction in the case of uh, uh, less than uh, more than 60% uh, ethylene evolution in the case of transgenic 
or abdosis plants. So finally, I will uh, end my talk by here, and I will uh, acknowledge uh, the DBT, DST, SERB, and uh, IRI in-house projects, and the GSPS fellowship for Japan for the postdoctorate. And this is my whole group, which uh, really helped me out in uh, performing these kind of experiments. I am presenting in front of you, but uh, these basically, uh, I don't know whether uh, you, you will be able to see. Uh, this is uh, Gaurav Agarwal and uh, uh, this is uh, Divya and both uh, married in my lab only and they uh, basically shifted to the US and they settled down the last experiment. Uh, means this is my all, uh, the uh, whole uh, group who contributed in one way or another way uh, by providing these kind of evidences and the whole uh, system. And I'm really thankful to each and uh, each one of uh, these fellow. And uh, I really thankful to you people also. I know, I don't know how many numbers are you are having right now for this uh, uh, lecture, but uh, I really hats off to you people because for more than one hour you are with me. And uh, because uh, frankly speaking, nobody listen. The scientist, uh, means our uh, scientific community, nobody listen at home to us. So we are thankful to you. You are listening and uh, attending our uh, this uh, lecture. So I am uh, really thankful to you. And the, uh, this is the, um, easy to say the road to the success is always under construction. And it is really, I am still 29 year uh, of service is completed, but still uh, the road, road to success is still going on. For science and uh, learning, there is no stop gap in that so thank you very much one and all and again uh, means i'm really thankful to dr duvedi sanjay duvedi as well as dr sundhya gupta for providing me this opportunity to present my uh, the whole group work in front of you people and uh, maybe i don't know the, the students if they understood the, the that basically that is the teaching part i was doing for them so if that is so i really thankful to that so thank you very much, uh, one and all. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, means uh, how to take uh, the course now. Uh, maybe that's the reason I told you. I have given my email ID to you people uh, and my mobile number also. So if anybody is interested or uh, means if any query, if I can uh, able to reply those or satisfy uh, those queries, I'm uh, ready to help. And uh, in my, my mobile and WhatsApp number is same. And uh, if you can send me, and uh, definitely I will reply you, not uh, maybe immediately, but uh, within uh, next one or two days, I will reply uh, each and every post, everybody's question. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank, thank you, you very much. Good thank night. You, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, uh, Shiv Kumar ji. Thank you very much. It's completed, thing, Shiv ji? Yes. Yes.